First thing I want to say is uh, I want to thank all the speakers and uh, all the patients and caregivers who came to the meeting. Uh, couldn't have done this without you guys, quite obviously. Uh, so the talk that I'm about to give is, I guess, kind of a weird talk for a neurosurgeon uh, to give. But the reason why I chose to, to talk about this is this is what's been bothering me when I see patients. And although I'm not a pain expert, I will never be a pain expert. Um, I like to do things that I find difficult because when I do difficult things, it sort of expands my horizons. And uh, um, I know that pain is a very big issue with uh, my patients. So I thought to tackle this on. And what this really came from was sort of you know, an evolution that I went through. Um, you know, for, the, for those who know me know that I've been involved in Chiari and Suring and Myelia since I finished college. And, you know, recently with connective tissue disease and with my patient population, I began to get involved in that. And personally, I have an interest in understanding fibromyalgia. And in dealing with all of these kinds of patients, it began to occur to me that there are similarities and patterns with how these different groups of patients experience pain. Now, this is this realization has caused some neurosurgeons to go down a very dark path and think, well, if all of these things are somewhat related, maybe there's a surgery we can do for all of these things. And we had people doing Chiari decompressions and fibromyalgia. That's not what I'm saying. Quite, quite the obvious. I'm saying the opposite. There are certain, clearly fibromyalgia is not a surgical disease, but there are certain aspects of pain that even the surgical patients, we might be able to help them with without surgery. Um, and if uh, this is sort of not an extension, but a deeper dive on what Dr. Oro and, and Dr. Green were talking about yesterday in that um, essentially how you think and how you feel affects how you experience pain. Um, if negative emotions and, and negative thought processes can make pain worse, and contrawise, positive emotions and, and positive thinking actually can lessen the experience uh, of pain. Um, but it's not just all in your head. There's actually, so what I wanted to do is when I started thinking about this and seeing um, how patients interact with caregivers and parents in my office, and I'm thinking I could do an operation and make certain things better, but there's a dynamic here that's actually gonna work against us. And quite, it's, you can't just come out and say that to people. Um, so, I had to think, there's got to be some, some, somebody somewhere has got to be doing some science to this. Changing these dynamics has to make things better. Um, but what's actually the, the science behind this? Before we even talk about that, let's talk about what, what is pain? Um, so we actually have a very fancy definition from the International Association of the Study of Pain. It's an unpleasant sensory emotional experience associated with actual potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Uh, so you don't actually have to have a third degree burn to feel pain. You put your finger over a fire and you feel that burn. Um, now also, you know, many patients describe their pain as burning. Nothing's burning. You didn't put your finger in, in a fire. That's also, that's pain. Um, it's hard to put into words, but that's probably the best way that, that we can do that. And we think about that, the, you know, I'll probably come back to this quite often, the analogy of, uh, you know, putting your finger in the fire and you go, ouch, and it's a very simple thing, but it's, it's not. That, that's, that's the sensory dimension of it. You know, where does it hurt and how much does it hurt? Um, but there's an emotional context to, you know, how unpleasant isn't it? You know, we talk about with subarachnoid hemorrhage, the worst headache you've ever had. Um, on top of that, 
there's a cognitive this dimension. There's this how we think about pain. Um, you know, when you get a blood draw, or for those who have, yeah, I've not experienced a lumbar puncture, but I'm sure many people have. How you experience that first one is going to affect if, what's going to happen that second time. If it was a painful, horrible, torturous experience how you react to the next time is going to be better. If it was a good experience, it's going to change how you approach that. Um, and that previous experience is going to affect whether you have fear or anxiety with relation to having pain or anticipating pain. And as we'll see, that affects um, how you feel pain and you know, how we respond to the threat of pain. All, you know, do we care or not? Some people have a lower pain threshold and some people have a, an ability to tolerate pain and that has an effect on it. But most of all, what's important in terms of how it affects our, our quality of life is when you have these symptoms, at what point does it rise to the level that interferes with function? Um, I'm sure everybody in this room to a certain degree just sitting here in these, not the most, I mean, these aren't lounge chairs that we're sitting, let, let's admit it, these are not the most comfortable chairs. Um, some of you have medical conditions and it's probably making you, you probably are experienced pain. Even if you don't have a medical condition, you're probably not that comfortable. Um, but hopefully, if you're listening to me right now, I'm distracting you from whatever is going on and you, you don't care. Uh, maybe in about 10, 15 minutes, you'll start to, you know, lose interest or I'll start to get really boring and that pain will come. So I'll do what I can to keep you focused up here as best I can. Uh, you know, and what I also want to point out is there's really, there's two kinds of things going on here um, in terms of the pain experience. Um, and you know, think of the nervous system as a computer. We have an input, there's a processing, and there's our response. Uh, but th the response occurs on two levels. Um, we got a pointer here? Uh, there it is. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, this is the reflex arc. This is what, you know, I don't know if, if people have noticed that when you do have that finger in the fire, you know, and you pull, it's, it's almost a two things. You go, you pull your hand and then like less, a split second later, you go, ow! So. The, the reflex arc, you know, that's responding, that's causing you to pull your finger out, but it takes, this information has to, that information has to, where did I go? Oh, that's the up button. I just showed you the whole talk, darn. Uh, so, that reflex, but this information has to go up to the brain for you to get that that understanding, that emotional context and, and psychological context uh, of the pain. Um, now, pain is not just pain. There's different kinds of pain. So I, I think what we most often refer to pain, uh, you know, is is an, is acute pain. That, that's an in, that's from injury or or more clinically nociceptive pain. Um, and that's from actual damage or, or threatening damage. And, you know, we subclassify based on where that pain is. So, you know, when you're having a heart attack, you got chest pain. If you're having a sickle cell crisis, that's bone pain, headache, um, and on and on. There's another kind of pain called neuropathic pain, which is caused by uh, a lesion in the nervous system. So if you have a Chiari with compression, if a spinal cord injury or, or syringomyelia, and it's damaging the spinal cord, you have pain relative to that, or a herniated disc. Um, now, chronic pain um, is something we're going to talk a, lo a little bit more about, um, because basically, after a certain time, and it's three months, now there are certain changes that occur in the central nervous system um, that are, are, are quite troubling. And so th the, the amount of time is probably the most important thing. That, and the other portion of the definition, complex sensory emotional experience, blah, 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 blah. Basically, it's really however you, ex it, it's different for everybody. Um, and there's another type of pain, I'll 
touch on, on briefly later on, uh, chronic regional pain syndrome, which uh, actually involves uh, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the, this is interesting stuff that I wanted to share with you. So regional pain, pain is common. You know, as I said, everybody here has got some sort of pain or discomfort that they're dealing with. Um, 20 to 25% of the population. Widespread pain, pain throughout your whole body, 10% of the population. If you have one pain condition, you're more likely to develop another more centralized form of pain. So for example, if you, know, you have arthritis and you got knee problems, you actually are more likely to develop fibromyalgia or something like that. You know, another thing about chronic pain is it also clusters with fatigue, unrefleshed sleep, discognition, and mood disturbance. And this is what started to really concern me and want me to go into a deeper dive because I saw that and like th there has to be a neuroanatomical basis to this. So now am I going to tell you about what the literature shows? I'm actually going to show you papers so that you believe me. <laughs> Um, this one paper, uh, and there's, th these are just examples, um, but what we find is the activity of the afferent or descending pathway, so that, that uh, picture where I showed where you have the pathways going up to the brain and down, these are actually altered by attention state um, and whether you have positive or negative emotions. So how you process, the, the processing pathways, the circuitry is actually affected um, by how you think or feel. Um, and what's also interesting is patients with chronic pain, the alterations when they, that occur because that are in the same areas that involve emotional and cognitive information that process the pain. Um, there's also an explanation for the development of anxiety and depression in patients with chronic pain because of this. And this is also why patients who have cognitive distortions and, and psychological distress and, and, and difficulty dealing with uh, issues like that are in increased risk for chronic pain and central sensitization. And that's also, that's a term that we'll t go a little bit more in depth uh, with as well. So what I wanted to show you here is that these are, this is actually the pain pathway. This is how, this is the processing center. Um, so when we talk about the information goes up and it gets processed and then it comes down, um, you know, it involves the brain stem, um, the cerebellum. I'm sure a Chiari patient thinking, hmm, the cerebellum is involved in pain. My cerebellum was compressed. Um, involves the sensory cortex because that's where our map of where the body is, you need to activate that to sort of know that, you know, it's my third finger that's actually hurting me. Um, the thalamus is involved and the, the frontal cortex and prefrontal cortex and cingulate gyrus, which are involved in higher function and, and, and uh, emotional processing. Um, what's really interesting is in chronic pain patients, um, through different, we see changes in the prefrontal cortex, the insula cortex, and the anterior cingulate gyrus. Uh, this is really more higher functioning, emotional processing, and insula, we'll, we'll see a little more about the insula in a bit. And this is not just on one test. Um, we see that on uh, MRI types of scans, um, there's, uh, you see changes in fractional anisometry, which is a measure of uh, white matter or, or the, the neurons or the conductive elements of, of the brain, it's a measure of their health. Um, we also see uh, changes in uh, certain uh, neurochemical markers um, and uh, we get changes in, in opioids. We had a talk about opioids yesterday and we have the internal receptors um, and uh, which we'll talk about a little more because they're an important aspect of this whole system. Um, and in animal models, we see uh, inflammatory changes in these areas from chronic pain. Um, what's also interesting is there seems to be two separate pathways that are really involved in how we process pain. So if you, um, if you distract people uh, from their pain, they, 
they don't respond, they don't report a different unpleasantness, but the intensity seems to be less when they're distracted. And uh, that is really um, mitigated by this pathway here with the amygdala, insulin, the sensory, and the supplementary uh, or the superior parietal lobule. Whereas um, if someone, depending on somebody's mood, um, the intensity is the same, but you see a, a big difference in uh, unpleasantness, and that's really mitigated by this circuit with the prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate gyrus. Uh, another paper here talked about how uh, when we have fear, it resulted in decrease in pain reactivity, but anxiety leads to increase uh, pain. And uh, this, this supports the notion that uh, emotional state is very important in, in modulating how people feel pain. Now, let's talk about this from an evolutionary context. You know, you're a caveman running through your I want to use Africa, but I don't think of how many caves are in Africa. But you're running through your cave land, and you know you're being chased by a lion, um, and you're running for your life, and you step on a rock, and you sprain your leg, and that hurts. The last thing that you want to do is stop and worry about how much that's hurting. You want to the you know the selectivity are, it was for people who were able to suppress that pain and keep running you know, regardless of the fact that they were injured the people who couldn't do that they're no longer around <laughs> uh, now our environment is also important and, and uh, this is what I was really getting at when I first started looking into this so <clears throat> If it, you look at people who feel pain, those who have a history of childhood stress or there are psychosocial stressors in their lives, um, you know, maybe it's a money issue, maybe it's a relationship problem, they're at increased risk for developing chronic centrally mediated pain. Um, if you look at population studies, if you look at it differently, you look at population studies, there's actually a predictive value to people who have had child abuse and trauma, whether they have uh, low educational attainment, socially isolated, they have depressed, depression, anxiety. So you can predict based on these things who are more likely to experience pain. So, you know, we talked about the pain experience before, but we can get um, a little more nuanced now. So obviously the input um, is important how you psychologically process thing, uh, things, how, how well-developed your coping mechanisms are and your mood is, um, and also environmental contingencies. How, you know, what's expected of you within, you know, culture, you know, certain cultures, people are expected to be stoic. Um, within families, sometimes you have more support, sometimes you're more isolated. These all come to play in how you deal with pain and ultimately what your pain experience is. Genetics also can, uh, can play a part as well. Um, now, I'll also tell you, you know, I think guess the big question is, yeah, how much does each contribute? We don't know. Um, but we know that certain conditions where um, certain ion ch children are born with genetic conditions where they have certain ion channels that are missing and they can't feel pain. Um, and certain other uh, genetic pathways, uh, monomimentalic mono pathways, they over, these conditions overlap with people who have chronic pain. Um, getting more into, getting a little more into the weeds, but uh, this is to perhaps get some of the doctors interested, but also I'm leading you down a path too. Um, the uh, COMT uh, methyltransferase, uh, when you have this um, genetic variation, increased risk for chronic pain, and genetic variations with the beta adrenergic receptors, uh, increased risk of fibromyalgia and chronic widespread pain. And, you know, we talked about serotonin yesterday as you know the feel-good uh, neurotransmitter. Certain modifications in this uh, increase the risk for uh, chronic pain. So, um, I started talking about 
the adrenergic system. And now we're starting to talk about, and I'm going to be talking about dysautonomia because I, I started to think there was a connection to this as well. But given the audience, I thought, does everybody, do the patients really know, when we talk about dysautonomia, do they even, it, it's this, like, it's Chiari. You know, it's this big thing, it's, it's, a, it's a word, but we, do you really understand what the science is behind it? So let's do a little dysautonomia one-on-one. So we talk about the nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. We, so we have the brain and the spinal cord and we have our nerves. But we actually have two semi-distinct different types of nervous systems. So we got the somatic nervous system and you know, that's what transmits sensory information into our body, and that's what controls our motor function. It's really our voluntary nervous system. Um, and uh, it's also involved in the reflex arc. So, you know, the finger in the fire, you pull it away. You're not under control of that, but that's still the somatic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system, that's sort of the behind the scenes control system. Uh, you know, if you will, that's like the electric and the HVAC system that's running through the hotel that's, you know, making the experience positive, but we're not seeing because it's hidden behind everything here. And, you know, it's, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the fight or flight mechanism, but, you know, it, it affects our heart rate. That's so what happens when you have a big finger. Uh, so it affects everything from heart rate, respiratory rate, perspiration, our pupils, um, sexual arousal, going to the bathroom. And it's divided into two separate systems, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic uh, nervous system. And this is what really, uh, they sort of act uh, like a yin and a yang. They, they, they balance each other. And you know, the sympathetic nervous system is what's responsible for the, the fight or flight. You know, when that, that tiger or lion is bearing down on us, this is what makes us get scared or run. And it conditions the body to do that. So our pupils open up, our heart rate goes up, we breathe more, that gets more oxygen, our blood flowing and more oxygen to the muscles so we can run. Um, at the same time, it stops digestion and it, it uh, switches off, you know, any sexual arousal or anything like that because these are the last thing that you need to be doing when a lion is bearing down on you is getting somebody's phone number. Uh, these are things you don't want to be thinking about. And when you're at rest, the parasympathetic system really slows everything down and, you know, the, you know, considering that biologically our, you know, an organism's purpose to live is to reproduce, um, you know, turn sexual arousal on and things like that. So these are in constant uh, balance. Um, now, the other thing to point out is the, although some of the way things work is a sort of a relay station between the, cent the central nervous system and the, and the end organ and there's differences in terms of where those relay stations are um, in the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic, um, but acetylcholine is is the transmitter involved in the in that relay station. But as you get further down, um, acetylcholine has different receptors depending on whether it's parasympathetic or the somatic nervous system, and you know adrenaline is responsible for the sympathetic nervous system, and, and not just from the nerves themselves, but we release it into our bloodstream from the adrenal gland uh, as well. So the reason why I led you down that path was, as it turns out, there is an overlap between the cortical regions that are responsible, that are, respond to painful stimulation and sympathetic arousal, anterior, in particularly anterior cingulate gyrus, insular cortex, amygdala, and they have opioid receptors as well. So there's two ways that we suppress pain in an acute, full, in an acute stressful situation. You have this inhibitory control in the spinal cord from these, from neuroadrenergic and serotonin neurons in the brainstem. So they project down to make us feel less pain. Again, 
you want to keep running if your life's in danger. Um, and they also release uh, endogenous opioids in a lot of these different regions, again, to suppress that pain. And this is the system that, you know, we take advantage of by giving people opioids. That's how it makes us feel better. It decreases pain. But as we're finding out, um, and I used to have to sort of soapbox this, and now I kind of don't, don't because of our, the epidemic, and now it's become obvious to people that this is not a system that you want to take advantage of on um, a long-term uh, process because there's a lot of unintended consequences to that, um, you know, clearly the most being addiction. Uh, what I also wanted to talk about is, again, um, acutely, pain, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> the central, the, the sympathetic nervous system helps us suppress that painful response, but long term, it's actually detrimental. Um, so fear is good, anxiety is bad, because anxiety actually amplifies uh, the pain. And it does it through a very complex mechanism, which um, I think we would get way down into the weeds uh, to. But in inter it's a complex interplay of those descending sympathetic inputs, um, changes in how these receptors, the adrenergic receptors, um, are expressed over time. Uh, you might have this information coming down to suppress the pain, but your body changes those receptors. So your ability to, the body's to deal with that changes over time. Um, but it's also, there's also interplaying with inflammation and the immune system as well. Uh, and I think this, this perhaps um, is, uh, you know, when I started seeing this, I'm like, mast cell activation, mast cell is part of our immune system. Maybe this is how some, we get this involved in a lot of uh, our patient population. Uh, but I, that was a rabbit hole. I, I don't want to be up here talking to you guys for three hours. You know? So I, well, let's just say this might be sort of that, that on-ramp uh, into that, that whole area. So dysautonomia, in particular POTS, paroxysmal orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. That has a definition. So when you go from, from laying down to standing, um, you will have an increase in the heart rate. That's symptomatic. So lightheadedness, dimming of vision, uh, confusion. And uh, there's also a, a, my, a variant of migraine called coat hanger headaches that's associated with that, uh, described in the occiput, neck, shoulders. So we have pain, a pain condition that's associated with something that's involved in the sympathetic uh, nervous system. And now, of course, dysautonomia, there might be, there's a lot of different causes and reasons. Some of it might be just due to the distensibility of, of the vasculature, um, but um, I'm a neuroscientist, I'm not a vascular biologist, so I'm more interested in the nervous system component of this <clears throat> um, and how that contributes uh, to this. Um, you know, Within the class, within dysautonomia, we also have orthostatic hypotension, which, may, which means your blood pressure drops when you stand up. And that could just be because you're dehydrated. But some patients with uh, an imbalance in sympathetic and parasympathetic tone also uh, experience this as well. Uh, <clears throat> now, many patients who have been diagnosed with POTS um, report cognitive dysfunction or, or brain fog. Um, and low levels of anxiety can exacerbate the symptoms. Um, and a high number of these patients have subclinical low mood and sleep disturbance. And uh, here's, here's the interesting thing, and this is probably, is that there does seem to be a role for psychotherapy in helping um, people with these things. And actually, might even help the aberrant physio, the, the POTS. You might be able to make these things better with psychotherapy. Now, we're not saying, oh, it's all in your head. But as you can see, when you have these chronic psychological issues, it does cause changes um, in how the brain processes 
things. And uh, <clears throat> we'll uh, talk about this in a bit, but you know, the next question is gonna be, can you change those um, brain changes th that occur? Um, now, I did mention central sensitization, and this is an important component, component of <clears throat> how this uh, chronic pain is experienced. So this was initially termed central pain when uh, there, patients who had strokes or spinal cord lesions had these incapacitating uh, pain syndromes, and this was later on expanded uh, to any type of central nervous system dysfunction that had persistence of, of chronic pain. Um, <clears throat> but as the signs developed more, they settled on central sensitization because what ultimately became understood is that when you, with chronic pain, over time, the brain inappropriately amplifies um, signals that are, that are coming in. And <clears throat> we'll get deeper into this. So, you know, we want to think of pain as, you know, you have an input, a process, and an output. It's a very simple circuit, but it's not. Um, it's probably more like this, a lot of different cross wires going everywhere. Uh, and actually, when you look at the neuroanatomy, that's ex this is exactly what you end up, end up seeing. So <clears throat> how does this work? So in normal sensation, you, know, you have a, a painful input, and this sort of goes to a relay area in the spinal cord, and you have certain nerve cells within the spinal cord um, themselves, but also there's input from above that sort of modulate or, or filter that experience, that, that stimulus, and ultimately this is how we feel pain. You know, likewise, when you have a light, you know, a touch, these are different receptors that get activated, and again, you, there's a processing and you normally feel the touch. In central sensitization, there's a problem with this filter or modulation aspect of the central nervous system, whether it's just in the local control of the spinal cord or whether it's the, 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 the signals that are coming from above, and these don't get filtered properly. So actually, the experience is actually more than would be expected. You know, a slightly warm touch is a burning pain. Um, there's also another situation where you can get cross wiring. So you get a rub, a light touch, and that receptor gets stimulated. And for some reason, you get a cross wiring, and because that filtering and modulation doesn't occur properly, instead of the pathways that let you experience that touch, you actually, from this little light touch, a light wisp, you experience pain, a burning, or a crushing, or, or what have you. And this is called allodynia. So, can neuroanatomical changes caused by the chronic pain be reversed by treating it? Yes. So if, you have, if you've had pain for years, and then you come to find that you have a Chiari or a Syrinx, is, or even a herniated disc, is there any benefit to Having that operation in the first place, absolutely. These things all can go back to normal. All these white matter changes and what have you, they can, there's scientific evidence which supports going ahead with the surgery. What about having psychological treatment? What about getting cognitive therapy, support groups down the line, things like doing yoga, as long as you're not EDS patients, apparently. Uh, <laughs> Um, can these things change the, the, reverse the brain changes associated with chronic pain? Um, yes, maybe. There is some evidence, but it, it's not very clear. The biggest problem that the researchers have with uh, this kind of, with, with pain um, science is there's really no way to animal model the emotional experience and the psychological experience um, because we can't test that. Uh, in animals, and these higher functions really don't occur uh, in animals, at, at least that we know of. So I'll try and go through this. This will we'll just go quick. Um, 
because we had a really good talk on pain yesterday. So there's lots of different medications and, and different ways um, to treat pain. Um, opioids really, as we were seeing, are our last resort. And, and actually, I probably should maybe change that uh, to say we should avoid it really at all costs. Um, the best way to treat pain, multiple uh, medications. Um, scheduling them and, and taking a, a proactive, preventative um, strategy towards that rather than waiting till people are in pain. Um, uh, we have to have a mindset where we're not going to eliminate all pain. Pain to a certain degree is good. Uh, when we're experiencing pain, sometimes that's our body's way of telling us to stop. Uh, of course, there's good pain and bad pain, but we're not gonna get into that. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're exercising, there's, there's a, uh, a, a statement, you know, uh, pain is weakness leaving the body. So sometimes pain is good. Um, it means you're stretching your limits, like me putting together this talk. It got painful at times, but, uh, and of course, you, you need, pain is so complicated. Um, it's, it's not something that one person uh, can do. When I, I was Dr. Miller, it's resonant, um, one of the things that I took up on so I wouldn't get, so I would, there wouldn't be complaints to him because there would be hell to pay if the patient complained was become a pain management specialist. So I got fairly good for that period of time understanding the pain. Okay, this is a neuropathic pain. We're going to give this. We'll give Elevil for that. Um, but it's really gotten so complicated that I, I don't think if you're not specializing this, you can really keep up with this. So, uh, it was mentioned by the panel yesterday that having a good pain management specialist is really important, and, and I would you know, concur with that. Um, the psychology, uh, very important. Um, I, just, I love Yogi Berra, I love his uh, stuff. It, it, you know, you're feeling the pain, you, and I can't feel that pain. I'm not, I'm not Bill Clinton. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's, a real, it's a real experience, even though I can't feel it. So, uh, but, it but it's also suggest, uh, subjective. And, and as we said, it's, that whole experience is dependent on the emotional state, goals and expectation, fears, and, and all things uh, like that. <clears throat> the important thing is, what, again, what's common to all these patients and what got me really thinking about this is, you know, you start with, the depression and the anxiety, which is part when you have that long-standing pain, which just very easily develops, but then it becomes this really, you know, circle down down a drain really, where that leads to low self-confidence and negative thinking. And when you start thinking negative, now it's like now you're becoming, you know, hopeless, and then that leads to desperation, and then you know why even bother? Uh, so, and again, this there's. This, there's science behind this. This is all, this is not me and just my observation, but this is in the literature. So, in order to deal with this, uh, you know, you can't, the expectation can't be there's going to be no pain and everything's going to go great and you're going to get back to normal activity and tolerance. And, you know, I think if you're, if you're going to a doctor or a surgeon who suggests that whatever he's going to do for you, that's what you're going to get, uh, that's probably somebody I would, I would run from because that's, I, I can't guarantee my work. I'm, this is not a tire shop where, you know, you have the surgery and if you don't like it, you know, we'll give you your money back and we'll, we'll undo it. Um, so anyone who's making a lot of really high promises um, it, it's, it perhaps could be dangerous. Um, but the expectation should be you're going to feel better. Um, we might have a few complications or setbacks, but we can get you through that. Um, and, you know, you may not be doing, you know, triathlons with me when we're all done, but we're going to, you know, hopefully Im improve your, your activity tolerance. And the right person to go to is someone um, who validates your symptoms. You know, just because you're sitting there and, you know, you tell him, I'm in excruciating pain, and he looks at you like, well, I don't believe you because you don't look like you're in pain. Uh, again, that's, that's, that's a red flag there. But you also, if you find the right person, you know, 
you have to trust that there's going to be, you need to have some skin in the game as well. That there's things that you can do that will help you feel better, that will be additive to whatever treatment, whether it's, it's surgery, it's an injection, or, or what have you. Um, and, you know, so for that end, if you need counseling or cognitive behavior therapy, um, you know, seek that. But relaxation, meditation, hypnosis, uh, Pilates, yoga, whatever, these things all play a part in, in making you uh, feel better. So uh, what I also want to get into is how is this related to syringa and perhaps uh, Chiari malformation and maybe also give you a foreshadowing of where I'm hoping my research is going to, uh, the direction it's going to go in. Um, I will talk very quickly about chronic regional pain syndrome only because we know that this is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. So it's a chronic pain disorder over six months. Um, to, mostly affects one limb. A lot of times it occurs uh, after trauma. Two different types, one with a confirmed nerve injury uh, and one without. Um, more common women, rare in, the, in, in elderly and children, so I tend not to see it. But you know, it's a painful, it's a sensory thing, so we talked about allodynia and what that is. So you get changes in how that perception of, of pain is processed. Uh, there's changes in the skin um, and hair and nail, so there's col discoloration, loss of hair. Um, you get swelling, uh, sweat, swelling, edema, and sweating. So this would be the affected, this is the unaffected. Um, you, problems with motor weakness and contractures and, and of course, uh, pain. And there's various different uh, theories on where the problem occurs. It can occur in the vasculature of the skin, the receptors or, or the neurotransmitters, um, the first, the, the relay neurons, the spinal cord, uh, or the brain. So we don't exactly, we know it involves a central nervous system processing, but we don't exactly uh, where the problem is. And there are treatments for this, medical, drug therapy, uh, and then more, you know, sort of interventional with blockades and, and uh, surgical implantation of, of stimulators. Uh, but, you know, so it's not, uh, but if you look over here, not just, you know, medication or surgery. You know, there's psychological intervention, there's different therapies. So that's another take home I want to give you guys that, you know, it's not just about, you know, the right medication or the right surgery. There's other modalities, uh, other tools, if you will, in, in the toolbox to treat pain other than those two things. So I want to expand your, hori you know, your horizon on that. Think about that because there's scientific evidence which shows that it works. Um, I'm just going to uh, go through this quick. This is some uh, work by Dr. Millerot on substance P with it, which is a pain fiber neurotransmitter. Um, and he did some autopsy studies on syringomyelia patients, which showed that um, where you had a lesion, um, that you had an increase in substance P uh, staining in spinal cords of patients with syrinxes below the level of the lesion and also on the side of the lesion. The unfortunate problem with this was that these were autopsy studies. So despite the fact that we saw these changes, we, there, was, uh, there was no understanding of whether there's relationship to pain or not. Um, and uh, so as we talked about, dysautonomia or autonomic dysregulation is, is how I think about this and pain. It's most likely caused by an imbalance of, between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Uh, and in particular, probably an increase in sympathetic drive. Uh, but it also may be a problem with receptor downregulation. The more you, over, the, when you overdrive part of the nervous system, what happens a lot of times to combat that is the opposite end of where that nerve is communicating to will decrease the number of receptors. So that's why things become, we develop tolerance to medication and, and tolerance to things over time. Uh, but the reason why I put that in there is that um, there's other conditions associated with this dysregulation, fell back syndrome, fibromyalgia, chronic widespread um, pain. Uh, 
Um, so we do know that there is, a, there is evidence that pain and autonomic dysregulation go together. Um, so what if we did some sort of, what if we did surgery? Because, you know, I'm a surgeon, that's, well, can we come up with a surgical, well, my hospital loves that, if I come up with a surgical treatment for a new medical condition, we're doing more surgery, we're making money, they like that. Um, but I'm not just, I don't think just like that. But you go in the literature, okay, is there surgery to be done to restore this balance? Um, so people tried, you know, with um, low back pain to take out the sympathetic chain in the back of the belly with the laparoscope. How those patients do? Okay, improve, improvement, zero, 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 lots of zeros, some 